Hey guys, it's a model of lead and steel. Today we're talking about the SCAR 17S. Stay tuned. Now the Belgian FN SCAR, or in this case the American made Belgian FN SCAR. SCAR is an awesome weapon system. It first emerged in the uh, early to mid 2000s, uh, mainly as a request from the United States Special Operations Commander, SOCOM. There was a weapons trial for some of the Special Forces units uh, that wanted something a little more capable than a standard M4 carbine. Now a number of different manufacturers submitted bids for the SCAR program. Ultimately, FN Herstal won and thus the SCAR was born. SOCOM's newest baby in both 5.56 as well as 7.62 by 51 NATO. Now the SCAR Lite, the 5.56 variant, saw some initial adoption but ultimately uh, was withheld from future, you know, recurring contracts. Uh, but the SCAR 17, that is the SCAR Heavy, the 308, uh, which is what I'm holding here, saw a lot of success and is still in service with SOCOM. Now, now what set the SCAR apart from some of the other competitors included its external piston operation. This is a standard uh, AR-18 design, which means it has a short stroke external piston system. Now AR-18 systems are all very similar in design. There's a little tappet in here, a uh, little piston that sits in the gas block. When gas is fed through the system, that tappet gets pushed rearward and it just punches the bolt carrier group, really, um, and sends it flying. You know, the tappet itself moves just a little bit, but the entire bolt carrier group obviously cycles inside the upper receiver. Now what that gas piston system offers you is a very reliable weapon system. During the military trials, the mean rounds between failures, or MRBF, for the SCAR uh, was significantly higher than that of the standard internal piston system M4. That means this weapon went a little longer in between uh, stoppages and malfunctions you know, during the same round counts and abuse testing. Now the benefits of the SCAR don't just stop at reliability and durability. The weapon's actually very lightweight. It's probably one of the lightest battle rifles in its class. That is a weapon that fires, you know, 7.62 NATO. A lot of that weight savings comes from the barrel profile. This is actually a relatively thin barrel profile, but FN is a legendary barrel manufacturer. They hammer forge and chrome line these barrels, and I loved this profile so much that I mimicked it uh, for one of my LMT barrels. I sent out a barrel to get profiled similar to the external diameter of the SCAR to save a little bit of weight. So not only do you get reliability in adverse conditions, you get a very lightweight and manageable weapon. You also get longevity of components, right? So it's not just, you know, will it function with mud in it? Uh, ultimately, how long will it function before a part needs to be swapped out because of a component failure? There are a number of different institutions out there, both, you know, public sector as well as private, that report, you know, scars going into the you know, multitudes of dozens of thousands of rounds, even hundreds of thousands of rounds, and some, you know, really crazy examples. I think uh, Battlefield Vegas comes to mind. I think they had a scar with something like 300 some thousand rounds on it or something, and the only part that really needed to be swapped out was like a hammer spring or some crazy stuff like that. So, I don't know. I mean, your mileage may vary, obviously, but from what I've seen, generally speaking, the weapon seems to be, you know, made of really good materials. Now, we're really gonna, you know, delineate between the Scar L and the Scar H because I think this is the the option that makes the most sense in the environment. I don't, you know, I certainly don't want to call it the uh, you know, sensical option if you want to fill a role with a 308 gun, and we'll get to that later. But, uh, you know, between the two, I would certainly select the SCAR 17 over the 16 uh, any day of the week. It's ultimately going to boil down to pricing. They're about the same price, but, you know, this one offers you a little more capability with that 308. Now, all of those factors combined, obviously, to give you a very lightweight, reliable, and durable weapon system. Again, a lot of it goes back to the gas system. Uh, the gas block in this you know, particular model is pressed and pinned in place. The gas piston operation has a little gas jet that sits inside of the gas block. That gas jet can actually be swapped out, which is pretty innovative considering this gun was designed in the early 2000s. It allows you to change the port pressure and the amount of gas that sits into the gun, or goes into the gun rather, during operation, and you can swap it out relatively easily. You just have to have the right kind of flathead to get in there and swap it out. So because the gas is metered by that little set screw, uh, you know, you're not really going to have to deal with a ton of gas port erosion. You can just swap out that screw as necessary. 
The gas block also has two settings for suppressed and unsuppressed use, and we'll get into that later. It has a folding front sight base that is dovetailed into the gas block, and you can flip it down so that you have an unoccluded sight picture there. Pretty cool. As we move down the upper receiver, you'll see some vents here. Uh, these are machined in the upper receiver, obviously, for like ventilation and stuff. Uh, but I wouldn't worry too much about ingress of foreign materials because the bolt carrier group is actually a very large unit, and we'll talk about that later. It sits inside there, and uh, as you can see, hugs it pretty tight. And so mud doesn't like to get into the system. Uh, it kind of just kind of shuffles out of the way there, uh, which is a pretty neat design. It's also very heavy. So in order to guarantee reciprocation of the bolt carrier group in, you know, in a reliable way, FN had to gas this sucker relatively aggressively. Uh, so if dirt or you know whatever contaminates the system, this freight train of a bolt carrier group isn't really gonna care. Now, I don't know what the bolt material is made of, but I know it's something proprietary because I've never seen a bolt break. Uh, I have seen some other breakages, but the bolt itself seems to be made of some proprietary FN steel, some wizardry, but it's pretty cool. The barrel, we haven't talked about it very much, save for the weight savings and the hammer forging. It's actually a very, very accurate barrel. I've had a number of these different scars, both the 20S and the 17, and a number of different barrel lengths. Uh, all of them have performed at least adequately with match grade ammo, and that's really a testament to FN's hammer forging process. Now, the upper receiver is made out of 6061 aluminum. This is an extrusion that is then machined down to what you see here, this entire tan unit. Uh, 6061 aluminum is an aluminum that works just fine for the firearms industry. Uh, you know, your standard AR-15 uppers and lowers are made out of 7075. That's, you know, an aluminum that has a better, I guess, compression yield strength as compared to 6061. Uh, and so it's a little stronger. But I've never seen one of these upper receivers fail in any real meaningful way. I've never seen them bend or collapse under pressure. And so I don't really think that's an issue at all. And having continuous aluminum means you have a continuous top picatinny reel, completely free floated, obviously. And so you can mount your IR devices up here without really worrying about a shifting zero. And obviously it's lightweight, so that's always good. Okay, that's enough on the upper. We talked about the gas system and the materials and all that jazz. Let's talk about the lower. The lower is a polymer unit, again, to save some weight. Polymer works great in this application. Uh, feels like it's some sort of glass filled nylon or Zytel type polymer. Uh, lots of ambidextrous features on this SCAR lower receiver. You can actuate the safety selector on both the right and the left hand side of the weapon. Uh, you have a left sided magazine release, which is kind of neat. You do not have a right side bolt catch though, which is, you know, one of those things, but it is what it is. Still works just fine. And then the standard magazine release for right-handed shooters is enlarged and checkered. Now there are some downsides to the lower. The mag well isn't really flared all that well. And so, um, you know, reloading this thing, especially under stress, might be a bit of a, you know, a tricky situation. You kind of just have to get some reps on it to get used to it. Uh, the trigger press or the trigger pull uh, on this unit is like a standard GI trigger pull. It's like maybe six, seven pounds. Not a whole lot of creep. Uh, I know G-Man makes a really nice uh, super scar trigger for this for you know a few hundred bucks, cleans it right up, so that's that. The other point of contention is the pistol grip on a SCAR. Unfortunately, not every AR pistol grip is compatible with a SCAR. They have to, the grips have to either be like machined down in terms of the polymer, uh, or the mold has to be made in a way that it works with the standard lower receiver. Now, I know a few guys that modify their polymer lowers uh, you know, to make standard AR grips work. That could be an option, but it's just, you know, one of those issues that comes from the factory. Let's talk about magazines. Mags on the SCAR-17, these things are super durable. Uh, they're made of steel. They're actually a variant of the FAL magazine. FN made some, you know, tweaks to the design. I'm not gonna have any problems with these mags long-term. The only downside is that they're kind of pricey, right around 50 bucks or so. Capacity, as you might surmise, the standard 20-shot mag. I don't have any reliable, you know, 25 or 30-round magazines for this thing. Uh, it's just something to keep in mind. Now, lower receiver aside, let's get to the buttstock. This thing's kind of janky. Okay, it's very lightweight, it's a very durable unit. I haven't seen very many of these things break, if any, actually. Uh, but it just doesn't really exude a bunch of confidence. Now, you can raise the comb height if you want. Uh, you can also fold the stock, which is cool. It's just, I don't know, man. It's super lightweight. Doesn't feel like it's made out of the same polymer as the lower receiver, but you know, whatever, who cares? Uh, if you really want to swap it out, I know Magpul uh, has an ACR stock that recently fell out of production, unfortunately. So if you want one, act quick. I think we have a few on the website. But Kinetic Development Group has a bracket that, you know, swaps out or allows you really to attach an ACR stock to the back of the receiver. And generally speaking, that solves that little bug if, you know, you want to deal with that. Now you may notice on the back of this unit, I have a little QD cup. That's because from the factory, the SCAR doesn't really have QD sockets, uh, but you know, guys like Parker Mountain Machine thankfully have uh, these nice little brackets that you can install. So if you want to run like a little QD sling, uh, that's a nice little creature comfort.
Now, when it comes to creature comforts, there are a few that you might want to add to the SCAR if you actually want to make this thing a little more practical at the range. Uh, first things first, when it comes to actually holding the weapon, you don't have a whole lot of room here. If you move too far forward, you may burn your hand on the gas block and too far to the rear, and you may impact the uh, charging handle. Now, reciprocating charging handle scar variant or the non-reciprocating aside, whether you're gonna be feeling that charging handle hit you in the wrist or slightly pulling the bolt out of battery, you know, just something you need to be mindful of. Personally, if I had to build one of these up again, I'd probably get the Kinetic Development Group MREX rail. It's like an extended M-Lock rail. Even then, it doesn't feel as natural as a standard AR. It's more money that you gotta add to an already expensive system, and we'll talk about that later. Now, QD cups and an extended rail are not the only things that you wanna buy for this thing. Uh, personally, I run a gg and extended charging handle. If you're putting an optic on this rifle, you definitely wanna swap out the little bitty stub of a charging handle for this extended one that kinda keeps your hand out of the way keeps your knuckles from turning into cheddar cheese grated uh, on the uh, Picatinny rails here. So keep that in mind. Now be advised, this is when the presentation begins to shift from glowing admiration of the scar to uh, a little bit more of a nitpicky nuanced perspective. Uh, when it comes to optics, we need to address this. The scar unfortunately loves to eat optics. Now you may have heard it before from others. Uh, reason being is because of this perfect storm of characteristics in the weapon system. Now issue number one isn't really an issue. It's kind of more of a double-edged sword. You have a very lightweight weapon system. So what that means is that more of the kinetic energy is moving through the system, being absorbed by the optic and the internal components of said optic as compared to some other gun. The weapon's also gassed for austere environments. Obviously, we need to put enough gas in the system to move that huge ass bolt carrier group, but also to do it reliably and consistently. And so you have a little bit more bolt velocity than you would with like a traditional, you know, AR-10 or something. And lastly, the mass of the bolt carrier group. This thing is huge, okay? For a short stroke, tap it, external piston gun, this thing is obscenely large. So with a lot of mass reciprocating in the action, you have more of the kinetic energy impacting the rear of the receiver. And so, you know, that main force vector that's moving back here um, is a little more, substantially more uh, rearward, which may kind of hurt optics from that perspective right when it impacts the rear of the, the receiver. But the second force vector, that is when the bolt carrier moves forward and the bolt impacts the barrel extension that isn't really drawn out well with a lot of optics manufacturers and they neglect to factor that into account when they make in, when they manufacture you know their prism scopes and lpvos and stuff so one of the reasons why when you mount an optic and you zero it guys will tell you to shift the optic as far forward on the picatinny rail as possible before you torque it down because when that bolt carrier slams to the rear the whole rifle wants to move rearward the optic wants to stay in place and so if there's a little gap in between those lugs the, the optic might shift forward ever so slightly and you know shift your zero and generally speaking manufacturers are prepared for that you know the internal recoil lugs that are used for either the circuitry or the led whatever's powering the system is made for that rearward traveling recoil where the optic wants to move forward however optic manufacturers sometimes struggle with the opposite direction that second vector a lot of those impact forces are going to the optic and the opposite direction to which it's you know designed uh, to be resilient against uh, and so you may get some problems. One of the big things that we had to deal with when designing our Promethean, the LP1 red dot, uh, was those two-way vectors. You know, our circuitry is coming in from Japan. And so it spent a lot of time going back and forth, putting things together in a way that kind of guaranteed reliability on this weapon system. And because of that bolt mass and bolt velocity, uh, I've seen these fasteners here on the back of some SCARS 17s actually back out and crack, believe it or not. I even had one of these from the factory, not this particular unit, but the last SCAR I had, uh, come with a hairline fracture down the uh, the entire screw there. So kind of scary stuff. You know, if, if it wasn't so abusive on the system, I wouldn't have really cared. But you know, these are little things you need to watch out for if you end up picking one of these things up used. Now you might be asking yourself, how do I remedy this? Well, like we talked about, thankfully there is a an adjustable gas jet or gas drive inside the uh, gas block here. And so if you head over to PMM or even FN's website, you can swap out that gas jet to one that's a little undersized. Now, obviously you don't want to go too small because you're going to get in the way of like durability and reliability, uh, but you can measure the amount of gas that's feeding the system so that hopefully you don't have a bolt carrier group that's slamming into the rear of the receiver and the buttstock as hard. Now I kind of went the lazy route. I just lopped two inches off the front of the barrel. So less gas is entering the system and uh, pinned on the muzzle device. Technically, this is a 14 inch barrel, not a 16. And so that was my solution to it. Haven't had any issues or reliability issues. I just left the gas jet alone and it works just fine. Now, whether you go with the gas jet option or you start playing around with the barrel length it's still going to recoil relatively harshly as compared to other well-tuned 308s now uh, you know relatively speaking the scar is still a lightweight gun and also recoil is pretty lightweight but as compared to something like uh, an ar-10 it kind of suffers in some categories
In my hands, I'm holding an LMT Mars Heavy. This is the general comparator that I use whenever I want to show the practical differences between a SCAR Heavy and a well-tuned AR-10. This thing from the factory, without needing any adjustments at all to the gas port pressure, shoots exceedingly fast and is a hell of a lot more ergonomic to run as compared to the SCAR-17. So yeah, even with those adjustments, the weapon still likes to wobble a little bit. Uh, and now that could be due to a lack of material in the rear of the rifle. Most of the steel and aluminum is up here, and so the balance is slightly off. Could also be my hand placement. Who knows really, but one thing is for certain, the Mars Heavy is faster. Now, while we're still shitting on the SCAR, let's talk about suppressing this bad boy. You can't. Well, you can, but you'll void your warranty. And no, that's not a joke. FN will void your warranty, or can choose to void your warranty, rather, uh, if you put a suppressor on your SCAR. It's one of the gotchas in their warranty provisions, uh, which is exceedingly odd, because there is a suppressor setting on the gas block that measures the amount of gas that goes into the system. So they give you the matches, and they give you the gas, and they tell you, don't start a fire. I don't get it, man. That's bewildering to me. And the last issue is going to be the parts propriety. Obviously, this is a SCAR. This is not an AR-10. It's not an SR-25 or TPMS pattern gun. And so if you lose a component in the field or you break something, uh, you're pretty SOL. My buddy, for example, broke his ejector retaining pin in the bolt face. Okay, his ejector just kind of went flying. He recovered the spring and the ejector itself, but the retaining pin he couldn't purchase online. It just wasn't in stock anywhere, and obviously, Evan didn't keep any on hand. So he had to make an ejector retaining pin. He had to machine one. A tiny little pin just so we can get his gun up and running. Absurd. And the last thing, cost of entry. $3,500 to get you into one of these things. That's a lot of cheese, dude. And that's without the cost of the extended rail if you want to run one of those, uh, the butt stock, the cost of the mags, your optic, and you know, you're buying a sedan. That's what you're paying for. And not to keep beating a dead horse, but the LMT Mars H is 2,500 bucks. It's substantially cheaper and you don't have to invest money in, you know, a different rail or butt stock. You know, the mags are super cheap, plenty available spare parts. It's SR25 pattern, multiple military contracts. Uh, so you know that you have a, you know, very dependable, reliable weapon system. And it's almost as lightweight. It's about a half pound heavier, this particular example. Uh, and most importantly, the owner, Mr. Carl Lewis, is not going to insult your intelligence with a gotcha warranty provision. You can suppress this thing all day without any problems. Oh, and obviously it doesn't need optics, so that's always good. Now, if you're like me and you bought a SCAR because you think it looks cool, by all means, you do you, boo-boo. Uh, it's a great rifle, very dependable, very reliable. It's just, if you try to fit it into a practical uh, area, you may end up doing a little better going with an AR-10 for a little less money. So that's that, guys. That's the SCAR-17. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Appreciate the help. If you want to support the channel, please head over to Lead and Steel. We'd be humbled to have your business. If you don't know already, uh, we have our own line of carbines coming, our own weapon systems, as well as our own optics, our duty-grade optics that are uh, being assembled here stateside. Uh, and our own nylon. So check us out, please. We have some awesome things heading your way. Take care. Be safe.